Thank you for joining us. The program will begin momentarily. Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for a critical conversation on ensuring women's role in Afghanistan's future, co-hosted by the United States Mission in Geneva and the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security on the sidelines of the 53rd session of the United Nations Human Rights Council. I'm Shahzad Akbar, and I'm director of Rawadari, an Afghan organization dedicated to building the human rights culture and monitoring the human rights violation, and the former chair of Afghanistan's Independent Human Rights Commission. Coming to you live from Geneva, I'm excited to moderate today's discussion, which brings together international human rights um, monitors, experts, and most importantly, perspectives from inside the country. Unfortunately, um, after nearly two years since the Taliban have come to power, we see the human rights situation in Afghanistan deteriorating. The space has particularly shined for women and girls who are being deprived of all their fun access to all their fundamental rights, from the right to movement, to education, and to work. Taliban's endless edicts have shined the space for everyone, but particularly for women. The space for monitoring human rights, for documenting the violations, for pursuing accountability is practically non-existent inside the country. The majority of the Afghan human rights defenders and activists are currently in exile, and those inside Afghanistan who are continuing their courageous um, resistance face intimidation, threat, and harassment. As the Taliban further entrenched themselves, we must not allow, allow the systematic exclusion to become the norm, and as a global community, we must endeavor to restore Afghan women's human rights by ensuring their participation in all engagements and holding human rights violators accountable for their abuses. The goal of today's discussion is to reflect on the urgency of the current situation, charting a path forward on how the international community can promote accountability and equal participation of Afghan women to ensure their role in Afghanistan's future. I am now thrilled to introduce our opening speaker, Lino Amiri, the US Special Envoy for Afghan Women, Girls, and Human Rights. Formerly, uh, Ms. Amiri served as a senior advisor to the US Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan under the Obama administration. She brings over two decades of political expertise, advising and working with governments in various conflict settings in the West and the Horn of Africa, the Middle East, Central and South Asia, and Europe. Her areas of focus are peace and security, with a specialization in inclusion and mediation processes. Ms. Amiri has served in the United Nations in various capacities and has and, has and continues to champion the rights of Afghan women and girls. Welcome, Special Envoy Rina Amiri. Thank you, Shia Zajan, and thank you to all of our participants who are here with us today. And I also want to thank the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security for their partnership in organizing this event on the margins of the UN Women Rights Council's 53rd session. I want to begin by uh, referencing um, how the, uh, the, the Special Rapporteur and the Working Group against uh, uh, discrimination on women and girls start their report. They, they begin by noting that the struggle for women's rights didn't start two decades ago. In fact, the struggle was owned by Afghan women, led by Afghans themselves, and goes back over 100 years. And they note that while that progress has not been steady or linear or uniform throughout the country, the gains made in different phases of Afghan history have been significant, and particularly in the last few decades. But since the Taliban takeover, since they seized power, they have been relentless and systemic in discriminating against women and girls, reversing many of these gains. I start with these points because we need to understand the past as we consider 
how to address the situation of women and girls in the future, how to forge a path to support Afghan women in the road ahead. And we need, a, we need an approach that is a short-term, medium-term, and long-term strategy. As we work to support Afghan women, we need to make sure that this time, there is not two steps forward and three steps back, but that it becomes anchored in Afghan society and is owned by Afghans and that it is there to stay. I believe we need to focus on five priorities. Foremost, it is imperative for us collectively as the international community to use every tool at our disposal to support their calls for accountability and for, for the full respect for Afghan women and girls to exercise their rights. We must continue to hold the Taliban accountable through our diplomatic tools to reverse the draconian decrees that are every day erasing half of the population from public life and imposing further hardship on a population that is already suffering from four decades of war and crippling poverty. As I've said in many forums, supporting the rights of women and girls is a, is a principle, but it's also a strategic imperative. Women's rights are integral to an economically viable, secure, and stable Afghanistan. There should be no siloing nor sequencing of women's rights. They are essential to everything that we are doing to ensure that Afghanistan moves towards sustainability and a, and a future of, that is going to bring real peace to the people of Afghanistan. Second, we need to ensure that this is not just seen as a, a Western effort, but a global effort. We need to bring in the region and particularly Muslim majority countries to, uh, to own the issue uh, and, of, and to own the responsibility of supporting women's rights in Afghanistan. This is a responsibility for all of us. We all need to stand behind Afghan women because the implications are, are going to be significant throughout the world. It is hurting Afghan women, but it is going to uh, bleed across borders and it's going to have implications for women's rights everywhere. That's why my colleagues and I spend a lot of time traveling and engaging the region, Gulf states, the OIC, among others. And I'm really pleased to see that many of these countries have taken a strong stance. They've issued statements, co-sponsored and signed uh, a really strong UN Security Council resolution in April with 92 countries, including 27 Muslim majority countries, uh, condemning the Taliban's actions uh, on education, on, on the bans on work. And they're also providing support for education uh, and scholarships and identifying other means to work with Afghan women and support Afghan women. Third, uh, as we continue to advocate that Afghan women must be included throughout these efforts, we need to make sure that they are at the table advocating on their own behalf. These should be women both inside the country as well as women who are outside. And they need to be in formal forums and deliberations, and they need to be included in every discussion, not just on discussions on women's rights. It, uh, it should not be not with the expression of not without us about us, it should just be not without us, full stop. Fourth, we must complement these diplomatic efforts with concrete support to advance education and economic resilience for women and girls. To that end, across the U.S. government, we aim to advance these efforts by hosting virtual education programs, including English language programs, compute, uh, computer and job skills training for Afghan women inside and outside Afghanistan. In September, on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly, the Secretary and I launched the Alliance for Afghan Women's Economic Resilience, a public-private partnership that aims to advance Afghan women's public uh, that aims to uh, support Afghan women's entrepreneurship, workforce participation, and educational opportunities. USAID has contributed over $6 million to UN women for crisis-affected women who will be supported by soft skill development and technical knowledge to generate income. And there are a number of other efforts that, that uh, um, I don't have the time to get into. Fifth, we must support protection and accountability measures, including uh, supporting the Special Rapporteur 
uh, Richard Bennett's office, um, making sure that his mandate is renewed and his office receives increased support and resources, and also exploring other means of accountability and protection for, for women and human rights defenders throughout Afghanistan. I want to close by noting that it has become commonplace to speak on the, of the resilience of Afghan women and girls. But we need to match that resilience with a resolve and a commitment to stand by them. Their capacity to succeed, to prevail, is contingent on our capacity to engender and nourish hope through concrete support and to match their resolve with a long-term commitment. Supporting Afghan women and girls offers the best prospect of a sustainable, stable, and modern Afghanistan at peace with itself and its neighbors. There are no shortcuts. The Afghanistan we invest in today, the Afghans we invest in today, will determine the Afghanistan for the future. Thank you very much. Now I'm thrilled to start our panel discussions. Our panelists include Medina Makoubi, a human rights defender and the founder and executive director of Vision Development Organization, a locally based organization. Richard Bennett, special report, special rapporteur on the situation of human rights in Afghanistan, who has worked extensively in the human rights space and in Afghanistan specifically, having previously served as the chief of human rights service with Junama. And Prashtab Bossi, a researcher at Human Rights Watch um, Asia with a vision focusing on research and documentation of ongoing abuses in Afghanistan. We'll start with Medina Jan. Uh, Medina, you work closely on the ground. What are the realities on the ground and in the political space specifically? How can the UN provide safe avenues for Afghan women inside the country to engage in policy making? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the Georgia University and the US uh, mission in. Uh, uh, Geneva for organizing this event on the sideline of the 53rd the Human Rights uh, Council to enhance dialogue on discrimination against women and girls uh, on Afghanistan. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and to find the voices from uh, within the country. I understand that there are a lot of voices from outside the country, but it's it's uh, rare to to uh, amplify the voices from inside the country, and I'm really hoping that these voices will be uh, reflected to their designs and, and programs for for Afghanistan and the future of the Afghan women inside the country. I live in Afghanistan in the region of Tonga, and I'm uh, having a local organization that works for the uh, girls' education and, uh, and different interventions for improving the situation for women and girls and the people of Afghanistan in general. Uh, there, uh, there are uh, uh, countless challenges and barriers, but uh, we are showing our resilience, same like uh, same like Afghan women have been doing throughout their their life uh, to uh, to show resilience towards the barriers and challenges and still make a difference. And this is the reason that I choose to stay in my country to make a to make a difference. And uh, um, the the challenges are no longer confidential, and if everyone knows. Um, uh, how they are in terms of lack, lack of access to education and uh, employment for uh, banning the women from, from working in, in the um, local and international organizations, the freedom of uh, movement, um, limiting the uh, woman, uh, women's movement and their participation uh, in the leadership positions and, and politically, and also um, uh, uh, women uh, can, can no longer be the the female uh, aid uh, servants to provide services in the in the aid sector as well. These are the challenges, uh, not only the basic level but also in any level that they can think of to shrink the woman's contribution in the social and economic uh, activities of the country. And this is increasing day by day. Uh, uh, but there are efforts by the Afghan women inside the country and also by the international community, UN agencies in, in, the, in Afghanistan and some other organizations that we are all trying to have the way for the women and girls inside the country to make sure that as much as possible is to listen to the needs and the voices of the, uh, the woman and bring up interventions that are really responding to the needs of the, of the country. For example, the, uh, there are investment on the girls' uh, alternative learning pathway to engage the adults and girls in the uh, informal education. Uh, there are uh, investments in the economic resilience for Afghan women because in terms of getting the, the license for Afghan women are still open and they are not banned. 
it's a plus point, and we can, uh, in terms of the economic collapse, it's a great uh, point that still is open, and we can invest on the human economic development uh, by by ensuring to engage them in the, in the income generation activities, and also ensuring that we we empower them economically. That will also reflect in the reduction of violence against women at the domestic level. Also, their safety, security, access to quality healthcare, their well-being, and also protection of some kind of things we can give them freedom of choices in terms of economically being uh, able to make decisions. Um, uh, and also, um, there are interventions that we can also tackle as, as a local indigenous in terms of strengthening the local organizations, women-led organizations to help women be the employer and also in, in, uh, um, uh, employ the uh, female, uh, female staff. But uh, my advocacy is not only to ensure that female employees are maintained, uh, their salaries are maintained, uh, and they can stay at home, but I also uh, want to say, and it's important, that not only in terms of the paying the salaries for a woman, but also ensuring their identity, their effectiveness, and their presence in the society, and also at the workplace is very much important, not only just employees, but also decision makers. And we should ensure this. Uh, and we can do this by uh, empowering the women who are in the decision making already by making uh, empowering the uh, employers, those organizations or companies that are being led by women. And we have so many companies, fortunately, in, in Afghanistan that, that are being led by the women entrepreneurs in the country. We have so many angels that are still functional, that are still operational. And this is very much important for the people outside the country to know because they think that everything is collapsed in Afghanistan. It is fortunately not yet fully collapsed. And uh, that's why we are, we are still trying to make sure to pass the way further and, uh, and engage the women and girls to improve the situation for them. Uh, the impact of the ban is uh, critically has uh, affected the women engagement. Uh, it also deprived the women's access to the services that can only be delivered to them by the female aid workers, uh, especially the basic needs uh, services. And uh, uh, we have the uh, engaging the local voices is very much important, uh, especially in terms of making sure to uh, uh, to have responsive and uh, effective uh, interventions for Afghanistan and future Afghans. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Rachel, you just delivered your latest joint report to the Human Rights um, Council, and we are eager to hear your insights from this report. Um, what's the current situation in Afghanistan in terms of human human rights, but also the ongoing humanitarian crisis? And how have you and your team reached and engaged with Afghan women inside and outside the country? Thank you, Shahzad, for your introduction and the questions. Um, and I'd also like to thank the um, Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security for supporting my mandate, um, and also um, uh, the US mission uh, in Geneva in, in the context of the uh, Human Rights Council 55th meeting. Um, yeah, indeed, um, we presented our report today. Um, and I'd just like to make a few uh, points about the report for the audience. Um, uh, it was mandated by the Human Rights Council last year in October, um, and as a joint report between two UN special procedures, uh, myself as the special rapporteur and the UN Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls. Procedurally, this is really unusual. It may even be unique. And uh, so we were um, really um, uh, delighted to be able to work together on this incredibly important issue of presenting a report on the situation of human rights in Afghanistan to make an analysis and also um, to make some recommendations for the way forward. Um, we went about this report in, in uh, two or three different ways. Mm -hmm. We undertook background research uh, and we consulted with um, many um, uh, uh, Afghan women um, online, individually, uh, in groups, um, and, the, and, and also um, we made use of a survey and then we went on a visit to Afghanistan about six weeks ago. Um, and we tried to really get um, an understanding um, of, the, of the situation. Our um, uh, conclusions are that the edicts by the Taliban, um, since they took power in August 2021, have step by step shrunken the space 
uh, for women and girls. If you look at the number of edicts the Taliban have passed overall, more than half are directed to restrict the human rights of women and girls. And I think uh, uh, speaking after uh, Medina, and it's a real honor to be on this panel. I often uh, am on panels and I say it's an honor to be on the panel, um, but I'm not often on a panel with three Afghan women. And that really is a massive honor um, for, for me. And I think I, what I'd like to say is um, uh, often there is talk about the strength and resilience of Afghan women, and also the leadership that Afghan women are showing in this incredibly oppressive situation. And I think what Medina has done is demonstrate how despite the restrictions, there is the possibility for Afghan women to exercise leadership. But having said that, the situation in our uh, joint assessment is far from ideal. It's really unacceptable. And we reached the view um, that uh, it is likely, most likely, that um, the crime against humanity of gender persecution is being committed in Afghanistan today, as we speak. Because, and uh, we've heard already from, from, from Rina uh, uh, particularly, um, that um, women have been banned from education uh, above primary level, the only country in the world to do this. And that has its flow on effects. If, if uh, uh, women cannot be educated above primary level, um, how are they going in the future to be doctors, to be teachers, to be business women, to be people like Medina and the other women sitting at the table here? You can't do that without and education. And so the future looks bleak, uh, especially for women and girls in Afghanistan, unless the Taliban reverse their policies. I just want to touch on what is gender persecution. It's a crime against, it's a crime under the Rome Statute, and persecution is the intentional and severe de deprivation of fundamental rights, contrary to international law, by reason of the identity of the group or collectivity. Um, we don't make a final determination of this in our report. It's not our role. Um, uh, but given the first-hand accounts we've had and our observation and research, we, it, we are critically concerned that women are being targeted because of their sex characteristics, because of their gender, uh, and because of the social constructs and criteria used to define gender, gender roles. And when it comes to accountability, then um, this is, should be one of the starting points. I hope we can discuss accountability more uh, further. I also just want to, before I finish, touch on the notion of a gender apartheid, uh, because we cover this also in our, our report. Apartheid framing was first used back in 1999 to characterize the situation under Taliban rule. And although this is not a crime under the Rome Statute, apartheid is a crime. And apartheid, um, which is often, which is only applied uh, until now on the ground of race, is understood uh, as inhumane acts committed in the contact, context of an institutionalized regime of systematic oppression and domination by one group over any other group. Now, normally uh, in law, one racial group over another racial group committed with the intention of maintaining that regime. Uh, we consider that there should be a study into this and a report done by the United Nations, not only for Afghanistan, because as we I think we'll hear later, there is a rollback on women's rights globally. The most extreme case is Afghanistan. Uh, uh, but uh, this is the time, in our view, to look at this issue and to fundamentally denounce and reject uh, the uh, uh, situation 
that the Taliban uh, de facto authorities have created for the women and girls of Afghanistan. And in fact, for the men of Afghanistan, because the impact will also uh, be on boys and men in, in the future, living in a society in which uh, there is fundamental inequality. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Richard, um, your work focuses on documentation of the ongoing human rights abuses and also advocacy. Uh, what are some viable tools and measures that the international community has at its uh, disposal to ensure accountability and to hold all of to account and make them uh, uphold their um, obligations? Thank you so much, uh, Charizot, and thank you so much for the organizers for um, organizing this event. It's an honor to share the panel with uh, Richard Bennett, the UN Special Rapporteur for the Situation of Human Rights, Marina John, and Charizot. Um, so I would like to um, take a, a moment uh, for all of us to respect the, the um, women's rights defenders and female protesters, so they're still protesting. Um, uh, we just finished the Human Rights Council session on Afghanistan, and I was looking that um, in parallel to the sessions, women were actually releasing videos, and they got together, and they were still protesting, and they still had demands from, from the international community. I think we all need to um, respect um, the, the fact that it's the women of Afghanistan who are leading this resistance today, and it's them that are still um, there and still standing, and um, in, in, in the face of all the brutal repression that they are facing, We've documented um, a number of uh, violations, the way that the Taliban treated these uh, female protesters last year um, in the prisons. Um, they have been uh, beaten, they were um, mentally uh, abused, they were being tortured, their family members were brought into. But amid all these um, uh, brutal acts, they're still going to the streets of um, Afghanistan, they're still um, protesting. And that means that all those women who are out there, they know what they're facing. So. Um, I, I, I really want to pay um, our, our respect to, to, um, to um, all of these women who are, who are uh, listening to us, and, and I would like them, them to know that uh, we, are, we are hearing their voices and we are actually here to amplify their, their voices. Um, um, a, a, bit of the, a bit of context, uh, I, I mean, Madina has laid out what is happening in Afghanistan, and Richard spoke about his, his report, um, he has uh, recently, I mean, been in the country. Um, there is all of these violations happening on women's rights in Afghanistan, but what we need to know is that the Taliban are doing more than that. They're also, there's arbitrary detention of the uh, journalists happening, um, they're, they're torturing people in the detention, there's extrajudiciary killing happening, and there is a blackout, total blackout of information. The Taliban are really making it difficult to monitor the violations inside Afghanistan. It has become so difficult to get information from inside the country, and it's making very difficult for human rights organizations such as Human Rights Watch to monitor. I believe documentation is a first step towards accountability, and I would like to bring an example. So the Australian war crimes inquiry, for example, is is a is a very good example of that. So I know that the wheels of justice is very slow, and it's very it's a very long process, and it has been exceptionally long in case of uh, in the case of Afghanistan. We've been waiting uh, for for international criminal court for years to um, to reach to an. Um, um, a decision on its investigation for Afghanistan, but, uh, if, uh, but, but it will get there someday. As we see with the Australian war, war crimes inquiry, we know that the UK has launched its um, own war crimes inquiry as well. So there are a bit of small steps happening um, there. Um, and I mean, when it comes to accountability, that's, I think, one of the long wishes of Afghan people. And um, again, speaking of examples, I have been just sharing a panel with my um, colleague from um, Ukraine, a Ukraine researcher in Australia just last month. And I was surprised and amazed by seeing about how many options did she have when she was speaking about accountability. We were sharing a panel um, at uh, a university and she was being asked about accountability for Ukraine and the number of uh, options that she had in terms of measure. I was amazed. I think what, um, what I mean, since the war started in Ukraine, the way that the world um, got together and sent a unified message and um, uh, unify their efforts to, to do something uh, in Ukraine is amazing. And that also shows that we can use that model for, for, um, uh, for Afghanistan too. And I think uh, that's what needs to be done. I think the, the international community needs to make sure 
that um, one of the things that we usually don't speak about is that when we prioritize one situation over another one, it means that we are deprioritizing and the bar on that one one is unfortunately so minimum. So, for example, we keep calling on Taliban to open the schools uh, for girls. We are not speaking about the curriculum. We're not speaking about um, the strategy for the day after that. So. I think we, um, the countries need to revisit, uh, revisit their policies and to see that how they're actually responding to a situation in Afghanistan. And um, it's, it's a unique, extraordinary situation, as Richard said. I mean, we are speaking about uh, um, um, what is happening in, uh, in Afghanistan, but we are speaking of women who basically have no say in, in social sphere. They, they do not have a voice. They, they, are not, they, have, um, uh, they do not have a social life. They are pushed back to their houses. They basically have nothing to lose, and that's why they're protesting. And um, I think the world really needs to consider how, how they're um, dealing uh, with the situation inside Afghanistan. I mean, when it comes to the recent ban on female age workers, it's impossible to ensure that the aid is reaching uh, the most vulnerable com uh, communities of so women are not part of that. It's impossible to make sure that the aid is reaching women if women are not part of that process. So um, um, I think, um, and, 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 and it, indeed, it's a systematic, uh, uh, um, I, I mean, range of abuses happening against women. So, I mean, for example, I'm working on a report about the health uh, access um, inside, um, uh, the, uh, I mean, in, in Afghanistan. So the Taliban are, there is a ban on education. They're not letting um, the female uh, doctors and nurses and healthcare workers to be trained. But at the same time, they're not letting um, male um, doctors and healthcare workers to see female patients. This is systematic. This is basically, they are, uh, this is denial of them and having access to basic healthcare, uh, healthcare services. So um, it's very unfortunate situation, but I do believe that still there are ways that the world um, can stand with um, uh, with the chorus of Afghan women who are still shouting for, for their basic rights. Thank you, Krishna John. I'll actually um, start where you ended. I mean, the Afghan protesters that you talked about, Afghan women protesters often talk about um, the international community in a state of rage, saying not enough is being done. Um, can can international community do more? All of you talked about this in some ways. What exactly can be, can be done to further to what you have spoken about before? Uh, specifically, how can the international community better support the protection and promotion of women's rights as human rights and encourage women's full, equal, meaningful, and safe participation throughout future policy discussions? Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, engage women in the dialogue. I, I learned at the local level, as I learned at the international level, and in, in all levels, engage women in the matters that are concerned uh, for the future. Uh, it's very much important. As you mentioned, uh, we need to do something for them, the hashtag. It should be inclusive, and they should be included in all the, in all the processes right from the beginning. Uh, this is the first, um, because all they are, uh, uh, when they are involved in the process, they really know what. Uh, how it's going through and, and what the consequences will be, because ultimately it's them who will bear the consequences. And investing on the woman, uh, woman empowerment, not only in terms of the beneficiaries or just employees, but also in decision making. This is very much important. Uh, this is based on my experience that we really see that you can make a difference when you're you're in a position that you can decide and you're in power. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you can also make, make a difference for others, for other women. It is not just the advocacy to give them food um, as the female beneficiaries for the emergency response, but we need beyond that. Uh, we need uh, a sustainable solution for, for the engaging women throughout this process. Uh, I, I allow other uh, other or other calls for my for my panel fellows if there will be anything missing that I can continue, please. Thank you. Richard. Thank you. Um, uh, today we were at the Human Rights Council and um, there are a lot of member states who made interventions and asked questions. I think there were 59 different countries. And it was interesting because I was sitting on a panel with Afghan women, and they were ask, still asking me my opinion of what uh, they should do to support Afghanistan. And so my response to them and now is, you don't need to ask me, ask them. And they're already telling you, but not only what to do, also what not to do. Um, because uh, certain members of the international community um, uh, engage in ways that Afghan women are clearly saying is not what they want. 
So that, that's one thing. I think in terms of accountability, um, and I, I note that Resta Jan talked about the, Ukraine, the options that Ukraine had. There are legal options and there are political options. The legal options are the International Criminal Court. When we're talking about criminal accountability, it is now active on Afghanistan. Some of us are watching very closely to see what they are finally uh, going to do. There's also possibilities for the uh, for universal jurisdiction, that's for each member state um, uh, to apply international law in its own jurisdiction, international criminal law. There is the possibility of engaging the International Court of Justice, the World Court, um, uh, not at an individual level, but at the state level uh, for violations, for example, of women's uh, rights uh, in violation of the a convention on the, on the elimination of discrimination against women and the Convention on the Political Rights of Women. And there are the national jurisdictions um, about their own uh, uh, um, uh, misconduct mm -hmm. in Afghanistan. And, and Pereshta mentioned Australia and the, and, and the UK as two, two examples. There's also political accountability. And uh, political accountability is around the points, I think, that uh, that uh, Melita Jan was making. That is, and our report as well um, has made uh, recommendations on, on this. Um, uh, firstly, ensuring that the situation of human rights, especially of women and girls, is central to all policy decisions um, on Afghanistan by other states um, and, and central to their engagement, if any, with the de facto uh, authorities and as others have said ensuring the the full representative equal and meaningful participation of afghan women in all discussions concerning the futures uh, the country's future and consulting afghan women as equal partners uh, to inform policy priorities and decision uh, making um, as well as amplifying as we are trying to do here um, the voices um, of afghan women um, and, and then there's also the protection issue. Uh, we talked about um, the need for um, accountability uh, due to the systematic and widespread discrimination against women and girls. Um, but we heard um, about the need for protection, um, uh, legal and, and, and practical protection of women inside Afghanistan. Um, the rule of law is now... Um, in a, a, a state of uh, um, chaos, or it's very, um, uh, it, it, it's very undermined in the in the in the current situation. But there are also many Afghan women who need physical protection, or have crossed the border to other uh, countries in the region, and many of them reach out to me uh, and to others um, in need of protection of the international community. Um, uh, and this includes resettlement um, and acceptance of, as refugees of Afghan women who have been who wish to leave. Um, and uh, uh, certain countries have already determined in Europe um, that Afghan women, as a group, um, are considered to be persecuted. Um, with, uh, Sweden, um, uh, Denmark, and uh, Finland um, have have determined that. The EU uh, Refugee Agency has also developed such a policy. And I saw that UNHCR uh, more recently in a uh, submission, a statement on a case involving Austria, um, has also come to the same conclusion. So this is an example of uh, protection as well. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, yeah, just to add uh, to the accountability point that uh, we need to um what well, i mean the culture of impunity has been ongoing in afghanistan for, for decades now and um, i think one of the things that we need to be mindful about is that any accountability mechanism should look into um all crimes that have been committed by all parties at all times um, that, that's really important um and on the recommendations i actually would uh uh i mean begin with uh with Richard, um, I, I would like to thank Richard actually for a very strong statement that uh, he made today at the Human Rights Council. And I think, um, I mean, uh, 
there, there are many ways that Afghan women, uh, the world can actually help Afghan women. And one of them, I would like to, to begin with the renewal, uh, the renewal of the Special Rapporteur's funding, because we believe that he's doing a great job. And um, the report that has been just published is, is one of uh, the very, it's a significant step about, uh, of documenting the systematic abuse against women that is happening in Afghanistan. And we need that. We need to um, make sure that Richard has enough resources to be able to, to, to do that. Uh, on the, uh, I'm, I'm happy that Richard uh, uh, raised the issue of visas for, uh, for Afghan women who are in the neighboring countries or those who are still inside the country and their lives are at risk. Um, and um, Richard also mentioned that the Nordic countries have, um, um, uh, I mean, kind of uh, eased on the asylum process for women. But one of the things that we need to remember is that they haven't opened legal safe pathways for women. So they basically say that if you if you arrive in Denmark, then you will grant asylum. But they don't say how an African woman can arrive to Denmark. So opening legal safe pathways for Afghan women is, is very important. I have a very concrete recommendation actually for the international community, especially, I mean, 59 countries um, have, have questions for Richard today, but they all can do something. Stop cutting aid on Afghanistan. So um, UK has just cut aid by 50% this year on the country, and it literally impacts every operation on the ground. It impacts the humanitarian aid situation. It's impacting women's access to healthcare services. And um, there are some other countries who have all of that. So I think it's very important to make sure that um, the countries are still finding ways to mitigate the humanitarian crisis inside um, Afghanistan. Um, and um, very small steps happening as, as we spoke about the resistance um, that is happening inside the country. The women of Afghanistan that are still trying to, to resist the system find alternative ways of education for them. I mean, that's, of course, that's not going to be an inclusive education at all, but those are the small things that we can do right now to, to keep the hope up for, for Afghan women. And I think more importantly, one of the things that we all have a responsibility as individuals, and um, I mean, uh, uh, the whole international community, uh, as individuals, uh, all of us, but also the international community, is to not forget Afghanistan. The situation hasn't improved. Afghanistan doesn't, make to the headlines anymore. This spotlight is gone. The situation and, and the Taliban are using this gap to to increase the attack down on, on, on basic human uh, women's um, uh, basic rights of uh, Afghan women. And I think it's very important for all of us to make sure that we keep raising awareness for uh, for what is happening there. Thank you. And then John, I want to make sure that uh, since you have traveled all the way from Afghanistan, that I give you the uh, opportunity to speak again if there's anything that you want to add. Sure. I want to emphasize on the facts that Mr. Richard and uh, Christian John mentioned uh, uh, on the things not to do. One, one of the things that the international community and some of the members, they perceive that uh, in Afghanistan, everything is collapsed. And I'm here to tell you that everything is not collapsed. We are still working. We are still on the ground and we still need your support. And uh, just because of the, some of the voices that you would hear uh, cut the funding and all the other uh, political uh, statements. Uh, for us, it makes the situation worse. We need sustainable funding for Afghanistan. She put it really well. It's not just about the political decision or political engagement with Taliban. It's about the people. It's about saving lives. We cannot, um, in a fragile state like Afghanistan, being in such a crisis, we should think of the people and saving lives first, and then with the political engagement or, or everything else uh, later. Uh, this is very much important and as an international community you can do a lot of things including if, if the girls education is banned you can still engage the women and adults and girls in, in the livelihood and income generation activities you can still help saving their life and and help them in destroying and not destroying their lives by early marriages or child marriages just because of economic situation or, or uh, you can still help them in reduction of their domestic violence because they all have income and you can, you can still uh, invest on the alternative learning pathway. You can still keep the Afghanistan in the agenda and continue funding not only for the humanitarian assistance, but also for the uh, social and sustainable uh, initiatives. Uh, at least we should stop it. We should not wait that Afghanistan's in the crisis. We should have the mitigation for uh, uh, strategies for mitigation the crisis, but in the meantime, starting some initiatives to uh, get out of the situation. And this is very much important. And uh, so this perception that uh, some of the international community member, uh, the members have that nothing works in Afghanistan, uh, that's really not true. Uh, we need to 
uh, we need to uh, inform them about the realities on the ground that you should have reality checks regularly to, the, to Afghanistan to see what works. And for this, amplifying the local voices and engaging the Afghans from inside the country is must to ensure that effectiveness and responsiveness of the interventions for Afghans and their future inside the country is important. I continuously say inside the country because it, it's important. We cannot evacuate at the end of the day the entire nation. No, there are people living inside the country, and and, we, and there's no intention to, to evacuate the entire country. People have to live inside the country. So this is important that, that the situation should be improved for them inside the country. And that's why their voice is important. And we should ask from them what works for them inside the country and what uh, what can uh, uh, what can help in betterment of their lives. Um, this is very much important for the international community to consider. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Medina, Richard, and Trisha for your valuable insights and recommendations. I think the main takeaway is to not forget up one stone, to keep the life on, to keep the flame going, to seek accountability and expand the space. Um, and violations should not go, should, the culture, we should break the cycle of impunity. Uh, that has pulled us back. I'm very pleased to introduce and welcome at this stage Ruthie Estrada Tang, the chair of the UN uh, Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls, followed by Ambassador Michelle Taylor, the US uh, Permanent Representative to the UN Human Rights Council to deliver closing remarks. Thank you so much, Ahasad. Thank you to the Georgetown University Institute for Women and Security and the United States Mission here in Geneva for this opportunity. And uh, as part of the closing remarks and reflections regarding what has been said in the panel, I'd like to focus on three points or three blocks to, to divide a bit uh, my, my thoughts or, or reactions. Um, the first is that um, part of I, what we learned in this joint report and that has really come through from your interventions is how this uh, systematic gender-based discrimination is revealed in different areas of life. And so sharing with you the experience of the Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls that regularly documents how this gender-based discrimination is uh, manifested in different areas of life. Uh, political and public participation, economic and social life, safety and health, family and cultural life. Uh, this methodology was really helpful for us to, uh, in the preparation of the report and especially on mission, document how, how this is uh, really going on in the country. For example, we visited a maternity hospital. So I think that this type of collaboration where we, uh, through the country and the thematic perspective, have uh, put light on these situations really goes hand in hand with what some of you have been saying in terms of how, this, how, the, how the country is functioning or how people are, are trying to survive, to function at the local level, finding, finding spaces to, to, to work for their rights and, and in, in everyday life. And so this is something that we could also document, apart from the discrimination, but really how women and girls are, 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 are fighting this um, creatively as well and with dignity and not only uh, in the streets, which is also creative and with dignity, but as you have said before, these are not the only methods. They're doing it in many, in many different ways every day. And so while the gender uh, backlash is not unique to Afghanistan, uh, this method of approaching expressions of gender-based discrimination in all the world, um, I think can also help us to then craft some proposals for solution as you have uh, expressed here as well. So the second point is uh, and connecting also to what was being said before in terms of human rights, uh, not only as a principal approach and as part of obligations under international human rights law, but also as a strategic imperative, as a tool that can be useful. How can we help the de facto authorities, push them to see that if this is uh, useful, this is necessary, we cannot build sustainable peace uh, and social interaction without human rights and without human rights of women and girls of half of humanity. There is no shortcut and we cannot fall into the temptation of thinking that we can build it without human rights. Um, and this is something that we have to not uh, um, keep our voices down about. We have to keep on insisting on this uh, as we've done in the report and as we want to keep on doing with uh, women uh, in Afghanistan. And the third part, thinking of these uh, solutions is, has, has been said, accountability and what we should do in terms of 
gender, persecu gender persecution, gender apartheid, comparing to other situations as you were uh, saying. And I was just uh, thinking, um, and there's reactions that have been triggered as we saw today from identifying these legal elements from the international community, which apart from pursuing these legal avenues, also fall on responsibility of states in terms of resettlement of refugees, diplomatic protection also, right? Not only waiting for the women or Afghan people to be in the state, but actually through embassies and consulates of neighboring countries to be able to offer uh, pathways to obtain, uh, to travel for the journey and to obtain uh, refugee protection. And then um, another point, uh, and lastly, is uh, what we've documented in the report, which are these slow and preventable deaths that are happening and that if the situation continues this way are foreseeably uh, going to get worse in the future. Um, and that we uh, consider that they amount to, to femicide. And so this is something in which the working group on discrimination against women and girls can offer. I offer it now for the women here and your, your networks and the people you work with. Uh, this, this forum to actually engage with other women. For instance, women activists in Latin America have specifically worked on femicide, how to document it, how to combat it, how to uh, prevent it. Um, and so in this sense, this is part of our work with, with women activists. And this is, I think, also one of the differences with uh, the first Taliban regime. We are now in 2023. There are networks. There's a transnational movement of women. We see it here. This is such a wonderful opportunity to share this way and to continue working uh, together with Afghan women, but now connected to other people in the world to keep on the spotlight and to keep on the hope in terms of creative proposals uh, to counter the, the situation and to maintaining hope alive, as uh, you said. Thank you so much. Transition. <laughs> I want to thank the organizers of today's event, in particular, the Georgetown Institute of Women, Peace, and Security, and of course, today's host, the International Organization for Peace Building Interviews. We also thank the Special Rapporteur and Working Group for their robust advocacy constantly for the rights of all Afghans, especially women and girls and all their diversity. We're grateful to especially for the Afghans speaking on the panel today. It is vital that we continue to hear directly from Afghan voices. These are your stories to tell, only ours to listen and to support in the ways that you tell us that we need to. This event has underlined the essential role of women in Afghanistan's future. The ingenuity and dynamism of Afghan women are necessary to relieve the country's staggering economic and humanitarian needs. Education is a human right and it is essential to any country's growth and stability. And the ability to continue to contribute to the economy and community through work are essential for all women. As we know, no country can function effectively when half of its population cannot freely contribute to society. The Taliban's repressive edicts on women and girls from obtaining an education above the sixth grade will have irreversible effects for generations. Limiting women's education and ability to work will exacerbate future economic problems and irreversibly harm Afghan society, peace, and security. We must and will continue to press the Taliban to reverse their restrictions on women and girls to exercise their human rights. These rights are universal and do not belong to any culture. We're committed to working together with the Special Rapporteur, the Working Group, and our allies and partners to protect the rights and freedoms of women and girls in Afghanistan. The time for action is now. If we do not stand up against the systemic discrimination against women in Afghanistan, we put at peril the rights of women everywhere. One of the most disheartening things that I heard today in the council session was that Afghan women feel that they are alive, but not living. And that is a direct quote. And I would say that it is imperative that all of us work to make sure that women have hope and that women feel that they have access to live again. So with that, 
This concludes our event. I thank you for joining and I hope you come away feeling as though we can be a partner in this critical, critical, important work that we have to do. Thank you so much.